Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today entitled Housing Not Handcuffs, Preventing Homelessness by Protecting Renters' Rights. This is another webinar in our Housing Not Handcuffs series. Housing Not Handcuffs is a campaign launched by the Law Center and our strategic partners with the goal of ending the criminalization of homelessness and moving uh, communities away from handcuffs and towards solutions that work to address the underlying causes of homelessness. Uh, of course, that includes a lack of housing. Uh, today, we will be discussing renters' rights, and we have an esteemed panel joining us. Next slide, please. Janelle, I'm not able to see these slides, um, so I will be moving through the slides on uh, my own. Uh, right now, I'm on today's presenters. It includes myself, Tristia Bauman. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, we also will be hearing from Daniel Saver, who is a senior attorney at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, located in California. John Pollock, who is a coordinator of the National Coalition for a Civil Right to Counsel and also Alicia Herod Blaine, who is the Principal Housing Associate with the National League of Cities. Next slide, please. We're gonna to go to the webinar housekeeping, and Janelle, uh, I will turn it over to you for that. Thanks, Tristia. Um, hopefully folks can see the slides now. Um, and moving on to the housekeeping, we will do a couple of um, polls throughout the course of the webinar, and we'll start with those in just a moment. But as we go through the webinar, um, I want to encourage everyone that has joined us to please feel free to um, submit questions or comments by using the uh, questions box on the right-hand side of your screen in the toolbar there. Um, another option is you can raise your hand using the little round button with a a hand and an arrow, and by doing that, um, if we have time for, for live questions at the end, we can um, unmute you for a live question, um, but you are also, feel, please feel free to just type your questions right into that question box as we go. Um, so we're going to start off with just a couple of quick surveys, um, and we would like to find out just, you know, what, what, do, you, uh, what do you know so far about these issues? So there will be a poll appearing on your screen that you can click directly into, and we would like to know how familiar you are with renter protections in your community. Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar? And uh, you can click right in there, and that'll give us an idea of, you know, who we have in the audience as far as your level of familiarity. So I will leave this open for just a few more seconds. If you haven't voted yet, please do so now. Okay. All right, so let me share these results with you. So as you can see, we have 16% uh, of the folks on the webinar today are very familiar with renter protections in your community. 66% are somewhat familiar and 18% not at all familiar. So that just gives us a sense of who we have on the call. And let's ask one more question. Uh, this is appearing on your screen now. We would like to know what types of laws does your community have or what types of laws are you considering uh, related to renters' protections? So you can select multiple options here. So check all that apply. Um, the options are laws protecting renters and foreclosed properties, rent stabilization laws, just cause eviction laws, eviction record sealing and expungement laws, or right to, house, right to counsel in housing cases. So we've got about a quarter of the audience has um, submitted their answer so far, so I'll leave this open <coughs> for a little bit longer. Again, you can select multiple answers if multiple apply. Okay, about half of folks have voted so far. I'll leave this open for just a few more seconds. Okay, 
So let me share these results with you. Um, so for folks on the phone, we have 48% of, um, of participants are familiar with laws protecting renters and foreclosed properties in your community. That's great to hear. Uh, about 24% familiar with rent stabilization laws, 46% with just cause eviction laws in your community, 17% with eviction record sealing or expungement, and 39% with right to counsel in housing cases. So that's great. Thank you everyone very much for participating in those polls. That just helps um, our speakers have a better sense of how to gear this information um, for you. So I will turn it back over to Tristia to continue the presentation. Thank you very much, Janelle. Uh, before I begin, I uh, will just let the audience know that I am currently battling a pretty nasty cold, so I apologize in advance for a weak voice and any sneezing or coughing fits that may take place during my section of the webinar. I'll try to move quickly so that you can hear from some of the healthier co-presenters. Um, but first, I want to talk about why we are discussing renters' rights in a Housing Not Handcuffed campaign designed to end the criminalization of homelessness and provide real solutions to homelessness. In other words, why do renter protections matter? Well, it's because a loss of rental housing causes homelessness. And renter protections are a very critical part of the system that can help prevent homelessness, unnecessary homelessness. <clears throat> it's something that people often do not think about, preserving housing that exists, particularly affordable, safe, decent housing in neighborhoods of opportunity is a critical piece of uh, preventing the rise in visible homelessness. It contributes when people lose housing to an overburdening of emergency systems like local shelters, but it also can result in the type of visible homelessness that has been uh, at the forefront of the media, particularly in places like the Northeast and the West Coast, the rise of homeless encampments, people living in their vehicles, and of course there's a relationship between increased visible homelessness and the rise in laws uh, that would criminally and civilly punish visible homelessness. So rental protections are really important as an initial prevention piece. Uh, why is it important to prevent homelessness? Well, one of the reasons is that it's much easier to prevent homelessness than it is to end it later, and preventing homelessness saves everyone money. Next slide, please. I won't go into this in much detail, uh, but there are a number of cost studies, and uh, they are growing in number. Uh, that have been done over the past 10 years looking at the cost of providing housing with the cost of homelessness. Sometimes the comparison costs of homelessness include criminalization, include use of the very expensive uh, emergency health care or crisis systems, and sometimes the comparison costs uh, are associated with just doing nothing and allowing people to uh, languish on the street as opposed to addressing their homelessness in a sustainable, humane, and cost-effective way. Nationally, um, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness estimates that chronic homelessness costs taxpayers between thirty to fifty thousand dollars per person each year. <clears throat> but housing can prevent uh, not only homelessness but reduce those uh, reduce waste by governments and save precious taxpayer dollars. Uh, particularly when money that would be spent on criminalizing homelessness are redirected toward housing solutions. Uh, there is a study from Central Florida that shows that permanent housing and case managers would save taxpayers uh, an estimated $149 million over the course of 10 years. A similar study out of Seattle, Washington showed a decrease of 60% in costs associated with homelessness and an increase in the cost benefit the longer people remained in housing. Another recent study uh, out of Massachusetts showed that over $9,000 per person, in fact $9,339 per person each year was saved when uh, that person was provided with housing and any services necessary to help stabilize the person in housing. And these are savings that are realized even after 
uh, factoring in the cost of housing and supportive services. And that Massachusetts study notes that people have better overall outcomes with respect to their health, ability to escape uh, addiction, uh, ability to become employed, and to stabilize um, in their lives, which benefits individuals, families, and entire communities. Next slide, please. So one area of uh, protections for renters that the Law Center has now worked on for years uh, is protections of renters in foreclosed properties. So I know that uh, most folks on this call are very familiar with the <coughs> uh, fallout from the foreclosure crisis that began in 2007, 2008. Um, but just for sake of framing and to help provide some context to the importance of protections of renters and foreclosed properties, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the foreclosure crisis, what existed at the time it occurred and what some of the harm has been uh, because of a lack of renters protection. First, we know that the foreclosure crisis uh, caused homelessness. In fact, it helped lead to an unprecedented rise in family homelessness, and uh, data shows that the foreclosure crisis is directly responsible for 19% of new homelessness in America. <clears throat> Renters were hit especially hard. Uh, and why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that there were not laws on the books to provide any protections for renters and foreclosed properties. And most of the interventions uh, flowing from uh, policies designed to address the foreclosure crisis were aimed at homeowners. And uh, renters really were the kind of forgotten victims of the foreclosure crisis. A study done by the National Low Income Housing Coalition in 2012 found that of all people facing eviction due to foreclosure, of all families facing eviction due to foreclosure in 2012, 40% uh, of those uh, were renters. The law at the time in most states was not equipped to handle the crisis. And by that, I mean there were in several states no laws at all um, on the books to address the scenario whereby a renter in a foreclosed property uh, would uh, face at the time that their property changed hands following a default of, uh, by the landlord. In response to the crisis nationally, Congress really for the first time legislated in the landlord tenant area and passed the Federal Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act. Uh, that law expired at the end of 2014, but while it existed, it provided several important basic protections. One, it provided for a minimum of 90 days written notice to renters and foreclosed properties before they could be legally evicted. It also made explicit that for bona fide renters, their lease would survive a foreclosure. Uh, and that's important uh, <clears throat> because people with valid contracts, valid lease agreements would, under state law, either have no right to have their uh, lease agreement continue once the foreclosure had occurred and it would immediately terminate, allowing them to be evicted upon little or no notice. Uh, and when you think about that, you know, imagine a family, um, and this was the typical case, that's paying their rent on time, abiding by all of the terms of their lease, has negotiated a contract fairly with the landlord, had no idea that their landlord uh, was uh, involved in a foreclosure process with respect to that rental property. And then suddenly a renter would come home from work, find their belongings out on the street, the locks would be changed, or they would come home to find a notice of eviction on uh, their doorstep and be given uh, sometimes as little as three days to find another location to live, which obviously can be uh, very difficult for anyone, but particularly for low-income people who may have children in school in a particular school district, people who are caring for ailing parents who receive health care nearby, people who have uh, no personal transportation, to so rely on public transport to get to and from their places of employment and who now have to find another location that meets all of their needs, uh, found that that small amount of notice 
and the quick eviction uh, destabilized them and caused some people not to be able to find any alternative housing, leaving them, of course, vulnerable to uh, homelessness, living in shelters or on the streets. As I mentioned before, the federal PTFA expired in 2014. Uh, Representative Keith Ellison from Minnesota has introduced new legislation that would make the PTFA permanent federal law, um, but that would need to be approved by Congress before uh, the federal PTFA again remains in force in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, so where does that leave us? That leaves us uh, right back where we were at the time of the foreclosure crisis, where many states do not have any or do not have sufficient laws to provide the necessary notice, lease survival, and other types of protections uh, that renters and foreclosed properties need to avoid uh, falling vulnerable to homelessness once their rental properties go into foreclosure. <clears throat> Just a quick overview, uh, since the foreclosure crisis, we have experienced uh, near unprecedented rises in rent. Uh, that is the result, of course, of increased competition for fewer and fewer units. Uh, today, there uh, are as many as uh, 69 people um, of 100 who cannot afford or access rental units and who have to pay more than they can afford to secure rental housing. So the number of people who are cost burdened, meaning paying over 30 or sometimes 50 percent of their income toward housing, is at an unprecedented high. We are also seeing uh, very low vacancy rates in some uh, cities like Los Angeles, uh, increasingly in places like Seattle, uh, vacancy rates can be as low as around 3%, meaning that landlords um, have a lot of ability to pass over someone with an eviction on their record, even if that eviction uh, came through no fault of the renter's own, like, for example, in the instance of that family we discussed who had been abiding by the terms of their lease, but because their property went into foreclosure, was subject to a sudden eviction. Now, this is not to say that a number of state and cities have not passed um, new laws um, to address the foreclosure crisis. And in fact, um, there are a handful of states, less than 15, but there are a number of states um, it, that have post-2008 passed legislation that is PTFA-like. Uh, meaning it provides all of the same or even more robust protections than the federal PTFA. Uh, but the vast majority of states um, do not have such robust protections, and in fact, roughly half have no protections, um, no new protections of renters in foreclosed property. What this means is that in a roughly half the states in the country, uh, a foreclosure can mean an immediate termination of an otherwise valid lease agreement despite the renter's compliance with that lease agreement. It can mean little or no notice before an eviction is filed against a renter. And it can result in eviction on someone's record, which can contribute directly to a risk of homelessness in that it makes it much more difficult for them to compete for housing in these tight rental markets, even if they are able to find an affordable unit. Next slide, please. So what can be done? There are a number of things that can be done. Of course, first, uh, <clears throat> advocates can uh, lobby their uh, Congress, uh, congressional representatives to pass Keith Ellison's bill. And I apologize that I did not amend uh, this slide to include the bill number, but if you are interested in learning more about the bill that would make the federal PTFA permanent federal law, please uh, contact me and I can provide you with that information. Um, and uh, also, uh, you can uh, work on state and local level legislation that would provide the notice and lease survival or eviction expungement protection that renters in foreclosed properties uh, need in order to uh, avoid vulnerability to homelessness. 
uh, you will also hear from our co-presenters about other types of laws that will protect not only renters and foreclosed properties, but prevent um, renters of all stripes uh, and most critically low-income renters uh, I'm referring to rent stabilization and just cause eviction laws so you'll hear about from Daniel Saber, the importance of a right to counsel in housing cases, because as we know, even the best written laws on the books um, are not worth much if they cannot be enforced um, and without a legal representative, uh, oftentimes the rights of renters are not adequately enforced and also what we can do beyond the law and policy side, engaging private landlords um, to lower uh, their barriers for admission into their rental properties and what it is that a landlord would need um, to be able to rent to people who otherwise may not um, <clears throat> be an attractive candidate in such a competitive pool. Okay. And next slide, please. And you'll hear about, uh, from Elisha Herrick Baines about that. Here is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me. You'll see my contact information again at the end of the webinar. As Janelle mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, there should be an opportunity uh, for questions, so please do feel free to type in your questions, and we'll get to those at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Daniel Saber. Thank you, Tristia. I appreciate that. And thanks to everybody who is participating in this webinar. Um, as uh, Tristia and Janelle mentioned, my name is Daniel Saver. I'm a senior attorney at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. And I will provide a little bit of background on a few policy options, um, focusing specifically on just cause for eviction policies as well as rent stabilization and rent regulation. So uh, I have here a little roadmap that where I'll be going with you today. So we'll start off talking about the problem and then I'll give a very brief framework um, and then delving into the policies themselves um, with a final point about administration. So not just the policies and, and what the laws would be, but how would they actually be implemented. Um, we'll cover all of those topics. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, I should mention the uh, one kind of caveat at the beginning, uh, which is that a lot of my experience comes from the geography where I'm practicing, which specifically is here in the Silicon Valley area of the Bay Area, um, and generally speaking is kind of representative of coastal California, which is to say I've practiced in a very hot and tight housing market. Um, Tristia mentioned that some places have vacancy rates as low as 3%. I was actually just in a meeting the other day in one of the jurisdictions where I work where the vacancy rate is now 0.5%. So uh, that just want to give you that kind of background on the dynamics of the housing market where I'm working um, that make these policies particularly necessary, um, though I do think that they would add value to providing stability for renters across the board regardless of the characteristics of your housing market. So uh, moving on then to describe the problem, I, I imagine that many of you who are on this call based on your interest in this topic are relatively familiar with the problem. Um, I would like to start off by just giving a, a brief story that will probably sound familiar to stories that many of you have heard or clients with whom you've worked. Um, specifically, I want to talk about a client of mine whose name was Dave, who was a veteran, who had a Section 8 voucher. He lived here in the Silicon Valley area, close to um, very good medical care, close to a VA hospital where he was able to receive medical attention for a number of different issues that he had. Uh, he lived in his apartment with his voucher for many years, and out of the blue, one day his apartment was sold, and he learned about the sale because the new owner came to provide him with a notice that he was now the new owner and at the same time also issued Dave, as well as all of the other tenants living in the building, no cause eviction notices. Um, the, we were able to work with some of the staff at the housing authority as well as a social worker at the VA to, um, and my client Dave to, to maneuver some extra time for him in the property that as many of you who are attorneys out there know, he, he didn't have an unabridged right to remain in his home. So eventually Dave did have to move out 
uh, based on this eviction that he received. He at first went to a shelter, um, but the in the shelter where he was living, um, it was farther away from his the medical facilities, and so he ended up missing a few doctor's appointments, which then led to him end up dropping off some of the medication that he was on, which led to greater instability in his life, and eventually he, in fact, left the shelter. Um, and last I was aware of, he was unhoused, um, homeless on the streets here, and was also relatively unstable. And it was very difficult for the prior support network that he'd been working with at the Housing Authority and the VA to actually reach him and, and work with him. Uh, what I want to communicate with this is that the eviction itself set off a, a downward spiral for Dave. Um, and so it's not just that he was already in a terrible situation, it's that this actually became a trigger leading to increasingly poor outcomes for him. So uh, that's the, and then the point here is that the displacement crisis is driving housing instability and homelessness amongst many folks. Um, in terms of to, to complement that story with some data, my agency, along with another uh, partner agency in the county where we work, ran numbers on all of our clients over a three-year period of time to try to build out the case for what's actually happening in terms of the displacement crisis. And I have some of the findings here on this first slide. Um, the one of the the main takeaways here is, you know, why are people being evicted? And what our data showed is that, at least in a very tight housing market, the majority of people are being evicted either because they can't afford their rent or they're being evicted through no cause eviction notices. They're being evicted through no fault of their own. Um, and you see this next point here is that we notice over a three year period an over 300% increase in no cause evictions specifically. Um, another thing this slide points out, complementing the story is you know, what happens when people are evicted in these types of housing markets and we had conducted a survey of some of our former clients and found that nearly 18% of them had experienced homelessness, or, or actually, excuse me, were in fact homeless between three and 15 months after their eviction. Um, and so this links in with uh, one of the main takeaways of Matthew Desmond's very popular book, Evicted, which is that eviction is not just a consequence of entrenched poverty, but in fact can cause it or worsen it. So we'll move on to the next slide. So in distinction to that uh, description of the problem scenario that we're facing here, what, what are we talking about? What, is, what are these solutions? What are uncivilization and just cause really about? And uh, the short answer is they're about stability and they're about savings, cost savings as well. So uh, tenant protections like rent control and just cause are designed to keep current residents housed. So there's, I know, lots of energy that's put into, and, and reasonably so, and, and that we in fact support to build new housing, particularly affordable housing. Um, that oftentimes takes a very long time and can be very expensive, and we have a number of people who are losing their housing now. So these tools are, are really tailored to actually address these specific folks, the folks who are living currently in housing, but that are at risk of being displaced out and becoming homelessness. Um, and then the second bullet point here, I think Tristia covered very eloquently earlier that there are cost savings by actually preventing homelessness in the first place. Um, and so by keeping people housed, these policies are able to save <clears throat> local governments money in the long run by helping to ensure that we have community stability. So we can move to the next slide. So now we'll jump into the, the substance of the policies. As I mentioned, what, what we found with the data that we analyzed is that the two main drivers of, of, of um, housing instability and homelessness in our area were rents that tenants can't afford and no cause evictions. And so these two policies are tailored to address those specific drivers of the displacement crisis that many uh, particularly urban areas are seen across the, the country. So on the first point of, you know, rents that tenants can't afford, we have as a policy solution various forms of rent regulation. This first slide here uh, is meant to be your takeaways. If, 
you want to zone out afterwards, make sure that these are the things that you walk away with. Um, the, the first is legality. So at a, as a matter of federal law, rent regulation has been upheld as constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, however, there's an important caveat, which is that it really requires a very careful state-by-state -state analysis. There are many states that have, in fact, banned outright uh, rent stabilization, rent control in those states. Uh, and so in those states, local jurisdictions are unable to pass these sorts of policies because they would be preempted by the state law. So uh, those of you who are out there working on this, I'm sure are very well aware of the state of the law in your state. Um, the, the second point is that within the bounds of, of you know, relatively open federal law and depending on the context in the state, there is a lot of flexibility to craft locally appropriate, innovative, tailored solutions that will work for the specific circumstances within your city. There's a relatively wide uh, spectrum of forms of rent regulation, both within the United States as well as models that exist in Europe. Um, and so it gives local jurisdictions that have the authority to enact these sorts of regulations a lot of leeway to design something that's really going to work for them. The final point is that, not to beat a dead horse here, but is that it's a very cost-effective tool. It is a way of keeping a large number of people housed at relatively low cost to the local governments that will enact these sorts of policies, um, which oftentimes can be a very compelling argument um, when you're advocating to get this sort of policy passed. Um, so we can move along to the next slide. So the, I know that history can be a little bit boring, but I do think it gives an, some important context, particularly for the, the policy and political debates that come when different jurisdictions are evaluating rent stabilization policies. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to walk through a little bit of the history of the evolution of rent regulation policies. Um, Academics and historians have typically divided these sorts of policies into two generations. Uh, the first generation sort of strict price ceiling uh, really came about in this country, at least during the war era, um, when there was a lot of concern about the disruption to the housing market and the housing supply with um, lots of resources being invested into the war effort as well as soldiers returning and concerns that they're that landlords may be taking advantage of folks who are coming back. And so these price ceilings, the older version, tended to be either price fixing, so the government stating thou shalt charge no more than you know, $1,000 for a one bedroom apartment, or so it be, or, um, or excuse me, so that would be like a price ceiling or price fixing, you know, actually determining the amount of, of rent that could be charged specifically for different types of units. There was a lot of criticism, um, particularly from economists, uh, of the first generation forms of rent regulation. There were criticisms about their impact on the supply of housing, on the quality of housing, et cetera. Um, and those critiques gave birth to the second generation of rent regulations. And I think the hallmark of the second generation rent regulations are that they have, generally speaking, learned from and responded to many of the critiques of first generation rent regulations. So one of my colleagues here uh, likes to say this isn't your grandpa's rent control, um, quite literally in many cases. Uh, so they, and I, and I think that one of the ways that this is distinguished in certain jurisdictions is describing the second generation as rent stabilization and a more first generation approach as rent control. I know in New York there are technical definitions to those two terms. Um, and in some places the terms are used interchangeably. But uh, you know, some examples of what have been done in second generation rent control to, to address the, the concerns expressed about first generation ones, for example, are exemptions for new construction. So there was a claim that if you have rent control on apartments, no one's going to want to build apartments because they're not going to be able to make a tidy profit off of it. So by exempting, and that will in fact suppress the supply of housing, which will just make prices go up under the laws of supply and demand. So many 
second generation rent controls will either exempt new construction or have rolling periods of time where a building will be exempt for the first 20 years after it's been constructed so that we don't suppress the supply of, you know, of housing. Um, in terms of the, the critiques of the quality of housing, you know, the argument goes that if there is rent control, then landlords aren't going to want to invest in their properties. Um, you know, why would they make sure that they're fixing the pipes or getting rid of mold if they can't even increase the rent? Um, there are now robust health and safety codes in many states uh, and some second generation rent regulation regimes create a separate administrative process so that tenants can actually better enforce those rights so that uh, landlords aren't allowed to let their properties fall into disrepair simply because they don't think that they're making enough of a profit. Um, so many of these, these innovations uh, or evolutions of the way that rent regimes have been developed I think actually address a lot of the concerns that you may hear as you're advocating for these policies in your cities. A lot of, of the public discourse about why uh, rent control or rent regulation is so terrible is really attacking the first generation forms and is ignoring the innovations and evolutions that have led to the second generation. Um, that being said, this is a very political issue as many of you who are working on this know. I know there's a lot of efforts underway and. Oregon and Washington and all across California as well as other locations um, to try and have these laws enacted and it's uh, there's very very strong opposition from the real estate industry including realtors and landlords and developers as you might expect so I'm not trying to pretend that this is you know an easy lift even though there are I think relatively um, sound policy solutions to the critiques that are often um, thrown at these sorts of policies. So we can move on to the next slide. So in, in terms of rent stabilization, a second generation version of rent stabilization, what are we talking about? What, how does it actually work? And so I just have a couple of key features as well as some examples. Um, the one liner that I usually give for rent stabilization as distinguished from other types of more stricter forms of price control is that it regulates the amount of rent increases for existing tenants. Um, and certainly this is true in the California model. So it doesn't prevent rent increases of all sorts. It just regulates the amount of those rent increases. Um, and typically this is true for existing tenants. There, there would be potential upswings in price if the existing tenant leaves. So it's in, again, it's just in, to emphasize, it's not typically an absolute price control. You, so if you regulate the amount of rent increases, how, how do you determine what that amount should be? The most common form is to have the amount of rent increases tied to inflation. Um, but there are other forms of doing it. Some locations have just set a, a, a particular percentage amount. So for example, in California, most cities have the allowable annual increase keyed to changes in the CPI. So it may be 100% of CPI or, for example, in San Francisco, it's 60% of CPI. It's a stronger form of rent control. Um, but places like San Jose, for example, just say no more than 5% per year. And they just set it that way. Um, getting into some of the second generation examples using California, second generation features using California as an example, is uh, in California, all new apartment construction is exempt from rent stabilization. Um, additionally, we have what's called vacancy decontrol, which essentially means that as a, a current tenant who is living in their apartment will have their rent increases limited. However, if that tenant vacates and a new tenant leases up, the initial rental rate will be determined by the market. The unit is said to pass through a moment of temporary decontrol upon the vacancy. And then thereafter, once the tenant has leased up, the future rent increases will be limited to the amount specified in your policy. Um, so it, it really creates a kind of mixed market regulatory approach where initial pricing is actually set by the market. And we're just going to ensure that later price increases are limited to a, a reasonable and predictable amount so that renters have the same sort of stability that homeowners with fixed rate mortgages have. 
Uh, and finally, it also exempts single-family homes and condominiums, at least here in California, and that's typically seen as a, a political um, uh, chip that was used to get this law to, to preserve the legality of rent stabilization because there are so many homeowners who vote. Uh, there are also, as I mentioned, various different adjustments to the, the rent levels that are dictated by the ordinance. So it's always important, and with my lawyer hat on, to have a process available for to ensure that landlords can make a fair rate of return to avoid any constitutional takings challenges. Um, and also, uh, many of these ordinances will have processes in place, administrative processes that allow tenants to enforce health and safety codes more quickly and more easily so that we can ensure adequate maintenance. Um, so we can move to the next slide. So that we'll, we'll move from that overview of rent stabilization onto the next policy, which is just cause for eviction. Um, the just cause for eviction laws typically complement various forms of rent regulation. So I think in an ideal world, you would have both of these policies in place as opposed to picking between one or the other. Um, it is true that as with rent regulation, there could be state by state variation in terms of the legal landscape that you're going to be legislating within. So some states may have regulations or laws in place that would limit the scope of rent, uh, excuse me, of just cause for eviction ordinances. But I do want to flag that there, in many states that have state laws that prevent rent control, they do not similarly prevent just cause for eviction ordinances. And I know that issue is a hot legal issue in some places. Um, but I think that just because you have a ban on rent control in your state doesn't mean that you can't still advocate for just cause for eviction. And I think oftentimes it is worth doing so because you can still have that, at least that layer of protection for tenants. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, so in terms of the basics of what is just cause, what I mean when I say that, uh, I think it's best explained when you distinguish it from what the current law is in most places. So my usual caveat applies where there will be variations based on state law. However, typically in, in most states, month-to-month -month tenants can be evicted for any reason or no reason with some limited exceptions, such as prohibitions on retaliatory evictions or prohibitions on discriminatory evictions, obviously. Um, what just cause for eviction does is it turns that rule on its head. So instead of being able to evict for any reason or no reason, just cause permits landlords to evict tenants only if they have a good reason. Most just cause ordinances specify all of the valid reasons within them. So they enumerate a list saying Landlords may only evict tenants if they can meet one of the following conditions, and then they list out exactly what those are. The, they typically fall into two categories. So I like to think of them as fault and no fault evictions. So even under a just cause ordinance, tenants can be evicted if they are creating problems. So for example, if you fail to pay the rent on time, every just cause ordinance that I'm aware of would still allow the landlord to evict you. Similarly, if you materially breach the lease, or if you create a nuisance and you're bothering your neighbors, et cetera, their just cause for eviction ordinances don't say that a landlord can never evict a tenant. They just say that you have to have a good reason, and, and these typically qualify as good reasons because the tenant, him or herself, has done something wrong. Additionally, just cause ordinances typically will include some no-fault reasons, so the landlord will still be allowed to evict the tenant even though the tenant has done nothing wrong, either because there's a constitutional requirement to allow it or because as a policy matter, we've decided that it's, this is how we're going to balance the interests of tenants and landlords. So for example, um, if an owner has uh, an apartment and they want to move in, uh, that typically is a reason that is permissible to evict a tenant. Um, Another common one has to do with renovation. If, if a landlord wants to evict a tenant so they can do substantial renovation work or they need to do substantial renovation work to bring a, a property up to code, the tenant, even though they may have done nothing wrong, would still be forced out. Um, 
the idea of just cause is to just try and level out the playing field, create a more fair set of rules so that tenants can't be evicted for no reason, but clearly when a landlord has a good reason that the, the community that's enacting this has decided counts as a good reason, they would be permitted to do so. Um, just cause for eviction ordinances typically don't alter the process for eviction. So the not only the grounds for eviction vary state by state, but also the, the process that landlords would have to follow to force someone out. Um, usually just cause does not um, involve itself in that process. Usually it has to do with simply giving the tenant a substantive defense once they get into that process. Uh, what's important about that is that just cause for eviction ordinances don't usually actually slow down evictions, which is a common complaint. They will instead provide the tenant with an opportunity to defend themselves, um, but they're not usually going to drag the court case out um, despite what a lot of folks um, who are in the real estate industry may otherwise say. So we can move to the next slide. So moving on, this will be the, the last bit that I'll cover just in terms of administration. Um, I think a key takeaway here is that just as there's a lot of flexibility within these policies to craft something that's going to work locally, you also have the opportunity to administer these programs in very different ways. Um, and that provides policymakers with a range of approaches um, so that they can make sure that what they're doing really works in those communities. For example, some programs have very active enforcement mechanisms where the city plays a much greater role in um, actually enforcing the law, so collecting data, monitoring, conducting enforcement activities uh, versus passive enforcement programs where the, the policy may in fact only create a substantive right for the tenant, but then the tenant has to, or, or the tenant would bear the burden of enforcing his or her right if their landlord ever try and brought them to court. Um, and then, you know, I think of this as a whole spectrum, and you can try to land your policy anywhere on the spectrum that you think is, is most appropriate. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, you know, costs are one major concern of a lot of local jurisdictions evaluating this. The, the reality, at least in California, is that typically these programs do not impact public funds. Uh, here, they are typically covered by a small user fee on landlords, and sometimes the ordinances will actually allow some of that user fee to be passed on to tenants. Um, so in that sense, these policies, I guess the takeaway here is that the policies can be crafted in such a way that they're essentially self-financing. Um, which again is, is something that public officials oftentimes like to hear when you're proposing a new administrative system, uh, that it's not going to break the bank. And uh, finally, you know, I said this now a couple of times, and I, I think it is really worth repeating that there are certainly great models out there for how to craft these policies, but that doesn't mean that you're stuck with what has already been done. If, for your city, the San Francisco model of rent control doesn't work, or if for your city, the New York version of rent control isn't going to fly, that's not the end of the story. There may yet be ways of crafting streamlined versions or inexpensive versions that could adapt to changes in your housing market um, that would be, that perhaps are more appropriate for different jurisdictions with different housing market dynamics, um, or that just have different political dynamics, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, I think this is one area where there's still a lot of great work being done. I know, for example, in Oregon, there's some very interesting work happening in Portland where they just passed an ordinance that wasn't exactly a just cause ordinance, but it does require relocation benefits to tenants who receive no cause eviction notices and also who receive massive rent increases. Um, and I think that that sort of innovative policy that is trying to plug the gaps as best as we can um, could really be a model in a lot of places who are thinking about taking an incremental approach before you get up to the, the full protections that are offered by these more robust policies. So we can go to the next slide, um, which has my contact information. I'd be more than happy to speak with anybody who's looking at this. As I mentioned, I know that this is a hot topic in lots of places. Here in California, we've seen a surge of interest uh, we actually had five ballot measures 
on in just the Bay Area this past November for new rent control and just cause eviction ordinances. And my office was involved in helping to draft three of those. So we've done quite a few surveys of different programs um, and we're very interested in working with advocates and community-based organizations who are interested in taking this on and could use some, some technical assistance. Uh, the good thing is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, more than happy to be in touch and pitch in and help. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. And that was great. Uh, now turning to John Pollock, who will discuss the right to counsel in housing cases. John, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased to do this. I think that uh, the right to counsel is appropriate to go last as it basically provides the procedural meat to everything else that you've heard about today, how we accomplish all the things we're trying to do. Um, so um, most important, one really important thing I wanted to mention, civilrighttocouncil.org is where you'll find everything that we know about right to counsel. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of bits about it that are relevant to this housing conversation in just a little bit. Um, we have about 300 participants in 38 states. We're always looking for more people who are looking to advance this issue. In fact, I have to say I was pretty shocked when the poll was given earlier at the beginning of this webinar and I think it was 39% of the participants said that their jurisdictions are looking at right to counsel and housing cases. That, that's fantastic. It's, it's, uh, it, I, I'm actually quite surprised to see the number be that large, although in light of some of the recent developments, maybe I shouldn't be, but um, really interested to hear what those developments are. Um, if people want to share those during the Q&A or just contact me after the webinar. Um, importantly, we don't, the movement on right to counsel and housing cases doesn't take a uh, one size fits all approach. What works in one jurisdiction may not work in another. It may be that in one jurisdiction, homeowners are the biggest party, in another, it might be tenants, it might be a specific subset of tenants, like seniors or people with disabilities. So we really tailor the approach that we take in each state to fit the problem. So, why is the right to counsel and housing case important? Well, it's basic human needs at stake, and not, not just the housing, but everything that flows from. Losing one's housing, as, as Tristia talked about before. There's also the fact that we know that counsel makes a, a significant difference in outcomes. Uh, basically, when when counsel is present, and there are many studies that have shown this, the tenant's chance of um, or homeowner's chance of succeeding um, goes up exponentially. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that research in a bit. Um, it's also about equity in proceedings. In, in housing court, there tends to be massive, massive um, asymmetry of representation. We often use a figure called 90-10, which means 90% of landlords are represented or more, fewer than 10% of tenants are typically represented. So not only do you not have tenants being represented in general, but when you have a system that expects that kind of dynamic because that's what always happens, it starts to adapt to basically only serve the landlord or the bank or, or those kinds of interests rather than the people whose homes are being lost. Also, um, important is increasing belief in the judicial system. If anyone on this call, and I'm sure many of you have, have been to housing court, it can be a um, demoralizing experience for tenants and homeowners who are not represented. It basically just seems like there's no process at all. The courts dispose of hundreds of cases in urban areas very quickly with, with no due process, no hearing even um, a lot of times. So uh, right to counsel can help increase people's belief in the judicial system. Um, there are significant financial benefits to providing counsel. Yes, it does cost money to provide counsel up front, but we're seeing increasingly studies showing that for every dollar that we spend on, on housing counsel, we save many more dollars in all of the kinds of homelessness um, consequences that Tristia outlined earlier. So the cost of providing for a lawyer winds up quickly being outweighed by shelters and prisons and um, emergency health care and all the other things that we, that we wind up paying for when people become homeless. There's also the fact that um, because of the criminalization of homelessness, many of the people who do get evicted wind up becoming, um, entering into the criminal justice system and um, through vagrancy laws, through panhandling laws, and so on and so forth. And so basically, our criminal defense system, which is already horribly overburdened and underfunded, winds up becoming even more so because we're not treating these civil problems when they happen. So. We don't have this, this chart that I've got on the screen here has a lot of numbers in it, and we don't have time to go through um, everything that has in it. I just wanted to give you an example of there were three studies that were done that looked at 
what kinds of impacts had were, were, were achieved when counsel was provided. And if you look at the first column, um, the thing that really jumps out, um, I'll, just, I'll just emphasize, if you look at the amount tenants ordered to pay to landlords in Massachusetts District Court, the tenants that received full representation paid nothing on average in the study to landlords, whereas the group that received limited legal assistance, meaning they didn't get someone to go with them to court, they paid over $600 on average. So a really significant financial impact on not just on possession, but also on the money that changed hands between the two sides. And if you look at the first, the first cell, you can see that there was also a significant impact on possession. 66% of the full representation group retained their units compared to only 33%. So two to one, basically full representation made, it, made a difference in, in um, the outcome of the case. <clears throat> Um, also, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, why not just let a judge decide why when a, a tenant or a homeowner gets counsel, why do we have to provide it for everyone? What about the tenants or the homeowners who have absolutely no defense? Well, the problem is that tenants and homeowners are not able to make the argument for why they need counsel. They can't effectively articulate those reasons. They need a lawyer, in other words, to get a lawyer. There are also significant issues with judicial bias in terms of the way that judges may look at the same facts differently. Um, one judge may say this warrants counsel, another one says it doesn't. Um, there may be bias against homeless people in general, um, and that can prejudice their decisions and so on. Um, and problems with appellate review in terms of when, when there's no lawyer to make an argument for counsel, an appellate court looking at the record says, you know, this doesn't look, this case doesn't look like any, counsel would have made any difference because the record's very one-sided. All they hear is the landlord's, you know, side of the story. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's being done to advance the right to counsel in housing cases. And starting with the, the first one, which may, some of you may have already heard about because it was really big news. Um, about a couple of years ago, there was a bill introduced, this bill, Intro 214, which would provide a right to counsel in ten, for tenants originally at 125% of poverty, and then it was raised in the bill was amended to change it to 215, uh, excuse me, 200% of poverty. Um, and uh, this bill has been the subject of a massive advocacy campaign that my coalition's been involved in, a separate coalition called the Right to Counsel Coalition of New York City, which was created for the purposes of this bill, um, has been working on for, for several years now, uh, lobbying and, and basically um, getting the support of key players in the system. The city council actually very quickly signed on um, to the bill. They basically had a veto-proof majority that were co-sponsors of the bill. So the problem was getting the mayor's support and the speaker of the city council. Um, and more and more public figures spoke out about the bill. Um, as you can see here, it had a video proof majority of the city council, the city comptroller, the chief judge of the New York court system all spoke out in favor of the bill. And I'm very excited to announce that just a couple of weeks ago, the mayor basically said, we're going to do this. Um, he said, we've, we're, we've already put $60 million into eviction defense, we're now going to go the rest of the way and provide what he called universal access to counsel. So basically anyone who is at 200% um, or below poverty in New York City will be entitled to counsel in housing court. Technically the bill actually reaches foreclosure too, but because um, not many homeowners would qualify at 200% or below the poverty level, it's not expected that part will have much impact. And we also don't know if that part will stay in the bill. It's, it's, that's going to be a subject of conversation. But this is obviously an enormous advancement of the movement because no jurisdiction right now in the country, city or state, guarantees counsel in housing cases, not a single one. So this is basically really, really groundbreaking stuff, especially for a city that has as many evictions as New York City does over something like 150,000 evictions or over 100,000 evictions a year. I don't remember the, the total, but it's a lot, basically, of evictions every year. And the city, which has put $60 million into eviction defense, um, is going to be putting in another 93 million over the next five years. How exactly this is going to get phased in, we don't yet know. That's going to be the the bill did not have specifics on rollout, and that's going to be written into the bill as over the next few months. But basically, the mayor said, "Yes, we're going to do this. It's going to happen." Um, it was in part of the state of the city address he gave, and um, we're obviously all extremely excited about it and, and and looking to see what impact this will have now on other cities and states that are looking at the same issue. One, one really important statistic I'll mention to you is that because of the city's $60 million investment, housing representation in New York City went from 1%, 1% of tenants being represented 
to 27% of tenants being represented. That is a huge increase in just a couple of years as a result of the city's investment. And at the same time, in the same two-year time span, the eviction, um, the number of evictions um, sought by marshals dropped by 24%. So the city was definitely seeing significant results from its investment, and that was one of the main reasons why the city decided to go the full way and provide it as a matter of right. Um, there's been really great press coverage of this effort in New York. Um, it's been in the Times, of course, and Newsweek and other places. Um, the New York Times wrote a great editorial um, in September, which we helped push for, basically that said the city should do this. It, the, city, the New York Times has said a lot about homelessness and what the city needs to do to, for homelessness prevention, and it finally addressed the right to counsel specifically, um, which, was, which was great. Um, but the other thing I'll say is um, this is not, the, you know, the right to counsel will not solve every problem. We, there are many, as, as some of the advocates said, you know, this is the first step. We still have to deal with the fact that a lot of tenants don't have enough money and that we need to increase the amount of subsidies that tenants receive, and that's actually in the works, too. I'm very happy to say that I've seen some discussion about potential movement in that direction in New York City. So, but the right to counsel will be so essential to basically, again, protect the rights of tenants in New York. Um, there's also has been um, legislation pending at the state level. I think that uh, it's unclear what will happen to that legislation because of the city bill that New York City is responsible for the vast majority of, ev of evictions in the state. And so if the city is providing a right to counsel, then getting a, a state bill passed actually becomes significantly easier because the, the burden to the state will be much less than it would have been. So we still have to see where that's going to go. Um, this um, slide I have here is way too much data and it's way too small print for you to basically um, for us to get into it right now. It's mostly just to show you that there were some competing studies that were done about how much a right to counsel in housing cases would cost or would save. The, the initial estimates basically put the cost at somewhere around 100 million to 200 million depending on what uh, what exact cost to counsel would be, how much they would get paid hourly, but a study that was subsequently done, an independent study basically found that it would not actually cost anything to the city, it would actually save over $200 million because not only the shelter saving, but also because the city right now is losing its affordable housing units every time someone's evicted, and because the city has a plan that says it will maintain a certain number of affordable housing units, it has to pay money to basically acquire new ones. And acquiring new ones is more expensive than retaining the ones it has. So basically, that, that report basically said there are going to be hundreds of millions of dollars in savings by not losing those affordable units. And that's part of what was factored into that, that report. Um, this is just um, a little bit of verbiage from the New York State Bill that I thought was really nice. Um, it just basically says, it saves all of us money in the long run. It's a human rights crisis. There's some great, we're increasingly seeing human rights and that kind of language working into, into some of these state bills, which is really great. Um, so that was just a really nice little bit of language. Um, a couple of things about the state bill. It, there are a lot of specifics here about um, the poverty level and who is going to provide services and how, how, much, how much compensation. And then there was a big back and forth about who is going to pay for it. And as you can see, there were three versions of the bill, and it went from the, the county paying for it to the state paying for it to a split between the county and the city um, and the match for by the state. So ha that bill has basically been on hold because of the New York City bill. We're going to have to go back and revisit that now and see what's going to happen. So the other bill that's really exciting in Massachusetts um, is actually a bill that was introduced as a result of the mayor, Mayor Walsh, actually. There's been a bill pending in the last couple of years to provide a right to counsel in housing cases, but it hasn't really gone anywhere. But it never had the backing of the mayor. And the mayor basically caused this, this bill um, to get filed. And as you can see, it's called an act promoting homelessness prevention. So basically, it, it is a right to counsel bill, but that's how it was phrased by the, by the, by the mayor and the sponsor, the bill sponsor. Um, it's limited to evictions. Um, it also is 200% of poverty, which is interesting. The, originally, the bill was 125. It got raised. Um, this version of the bill went up, probably because New York City bill did 200%, I'm guessing, but we don't actually know. There are a lot of details that are not specified in the bill. And what it actually says is that um, it basically, if the bill passes, that it creates a task force to sort of figure out how to implement the right to counsel. 
but they only have one year to produce a report and then the implementation the right to counsel have to go into effect within two years of the passage of the bill. So it's not just creating a study committee to look at the issue, it actually sets a hard deadline on when the right to counsel would have to go into effect. So that's a really exciting, um, a really exciting effort in New York. There, have been, there were some research, um, there has been research done in Massachusetts supporting this bill. I have the source here, we won't go into it except to show you that they've got some really great cost savings um, numbers here about how much they save for every dollar. They spend $2.69 um, to avoid eviction and foreclosure. So that, that's helpful in terms of supporting the state bill. Also, legislation in D.C., where, again, there was a bill filed in 2016. It didn't survive. The bill was refiled this session um, by um, Councilman McDuffie. Um, it basically would increase housing representation funding, but it basically states a goal of moving towards the right to counsel. So the bill doesn't itself provide a right to counsel, but it would um, it would basically say this is the direction we're, we're aiming to move into. Um, it's limited to 200%. It has a mix of different kinds of services provided. So it's a very um, aspirational, it, it would be great if it passes and it will definitely get us moving in the right direction in D.C. Um, and lastly, uh, in Philadelphia, the city passed a resolution, um, and I apologize if you hear uh, what sounds like an air raid siren in the background, but they're testing the tornado sirens where I live today, so I apologize for that. Um, resolution, this resolution which passed last year created a legislative committee to basically inspect how to deal with the housing crisis in Philly, including whether or not right to counsel is the solution, and there are these great findings that are at the beginning of the ordinance that say, whereas the city finds that tenants with attorneys are less likely to be evicted, it's cost effective. It's one of the best measures to prevent evictions, housing, and civilian homelessness. So again, really nice um, language. And as you can see also the statistics, 85% 85 of landlords have representation, only 5 to 8% of tenants. So again, a massive disparity of representation motivating this, this investigation. Um, in San Francisco, there was an ordinance passed um, in 2012 that said we want to be the first right to council city. And the first step that they took to move towards that was to hire a coordinator to basically increase eviction defense services through pro bono. Um, and the results of the project, as you can see here, they, they found the tenants were more likely to stay home when they got full representation. Um, 609 tenants were more likely to avoid homelessness. And then they found about, a, they averaged about a million dollars in savings as a result of the, the project that, that they ran over several years to provide eviction defense. Um, and they factored in an average shelter stay of 60 days. So um, the San Francisco effort is going to be revisited. I think right now the city is very focused on immigration, um, right to counsel and access to lawyers. So I think housing is on the back burner at the moment, but we hope it will come back. Um, addition, in addition to the legislation, there are research efforts, as you can see here, in a number of jurisdictions that are looking at what impact does counsel have on, um, on housing cases. Um, in California, they're doing pilots on a number of subject areas, one of which is evictions, and then D.C., Massachusetts, and San Francisco all have pilot projects going that are, or, or have finished, that basically looked at the impact of providing counsel. The funding for those, really interestingly, government, foundation, city government, state government, court fee increase, people getting creative on ways to fund increased representation and studying the impact of counsel. Um, I wanted to direct you to a couple of resources that will help you keep track of all this because this is basically a moving target. It changes all the time. On our website, if you go to um, civilrightscouncil.org and you go to what we call our interactive map and you say, hey, I want to know like, what's going on around the country right now and I want to know housing in specific, you can choose a filter as I show you here on subject area. You can pick housing evictions. There's also housing discrimination, housing general, which covers sorts of stuff that doesn't fit into any box. Um, and it, basically the states that turn orange are states where something's happening. Um, and if you can see here, this is an example. Of, I've clicked on Pennsylvania and a little pop-up has come up showing the ordinance that we just talked about. And then you can click on the hyperlink and see even more information if you wanted to. But basically, for any subject area you want, not just housing, but we're talking about housing today, you can choose, you can filter um, by subject area and you can also choose development type in the filter if you wanted to be like, I only care about legislation, I only care about litigation, I only care about research, you can filter by that as well if you want to. Um, additionally, if you say, well, I want to know what is the status of the existing law on housing, 
Um, you can also do that. There's a view on the map called Right to Counsel Status, and you can see it says uh, here I've picked housing discrimination, and we've got some state states that popped up here. You'll see there's a little map key on the right that says that these states are pink, and it'll explain what that means. And you can click on the state; it'll give you all the details as to why you know why it's highlighted that way. Um, so basically, we, this is something that we keep track of. We update this every day as we learn about new things going on. So to the attendees who are so the 39% of you who said that your jurisdictions are exploring or ha have, I, I know there's nowhere that has a right to counsel other than uh, New York City, but did you, your, your jurisdictions are exploring that, I would love to talk to you, and we'd love to be able to track that but to the degree it's trackable on our website. And lastly, our comprehensive bibliography also on the website has every subject matter in civil areas documented, including housing, and then you can see specifically within there it's got broken out by studies and reports and legislation and media and so on and so forth. And you can drill down and see what has been written, articles, like news stories, large articles, studies, reports, um, whatever it is, all of it is is there on our website. Um, and lastly, there has been a lot written about why there should be a right to counsel in housing cases. It often can be helpful to have these sources to, if you are um, looking to advance something in your jurisdiction, it can provide some of the some of the numbers, some of the logic, you know, the, the arguments that have been made, the human rights and otherwise. So um, I would encourage you to check these resources out. And um, again, you know, feel free to contact us. Um, I don't actually have a slide with my contact information, but um, jpollock at publicjustice.org is my email address. It's also all over the website, civilrightscouncil.org. And we would love, again, to work with any of you that are um, working on this issue. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about this. and. We're just so glad to see this. Um, we again see this as an integral plank in the housing, the housing not handcuffs campaign. It's it's a critical piece that can this keep people in housing and keep them out of handcuffs. Great, thank you so very much, John, for that. <clears throat> now let's uh, shift gears a, a bit and talk about some non-legal strategies that can also help protect renters across the country and prevent homelessness. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Elisha Herrig-Blaine to talk about engaging landlords. Thank you. Elisha, take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you all for... Uh, for inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, again, my name is Elisha Herrig Blaine. I'm the principal housing associate here at the National League of Cities. Um, I uh, just wanted to start out by uh, providing some background information about who NLC is and uh, wanted to really talk today um, about some of the lessons that we have learned through our program work uh, on landlord engagement and recruitment and how hopefully you all can take some of those lessons um, and apply them uh, to your work uh, to prevent uh, prevent homelessness. Uh, next slide. So NLC was founded in 1924, and our tagline is pretty straightforward. We're dedicated to helping city leaders build better communities. Uh, we are a member-based organization. You can go to the next slide. So cities pay us dues directly. And we are uh, really divided into three main areas. We have a federal advocacy team, and then we have two departments uh, that do technical assistance and research on behalf of cities and with cities, uh, one of which is where I am located in our Center for City Solutions, and then we also have our Institute for Youth Education and Families. You can see on the slide that we have more than 1,700 cities that directly pay us dues. Um, and then there are also state municipal leagues across the country in 49 states, uh, and those state municipal leagues represent uh, cities and towns uh, to the state legislatures, and those state municipal leagues are all members of NLC. And so through that network, we represent the more than 19,000 cities, towns, and villages across the country. Next slide. So I lead our work on veterans housing and over the last few years, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, been the lead partner with federal agencies on the Marriage Challenge to End Veteran Homelessness. Um, as I hope many of you are aware, uh, this is a national effort to encourage local leaders to uh, 
acknowledge publicly their commitment to the goal of ending veteran homelessness. Um, over the last uh, about three and a half years, we've had more than 880 local elected officials uh, participate in the challenge. And I think one of really the big things that I, I'm uh, always encouraging people to think about the challenge as is not so much as an initiative, uh, but more as a mechanism through which you can engage with your local elected officials. Next slide. And it was really through that that we got into the space of landlord engagement and trying to figure out how we could better talk with landlords about the needs that communities were having um, to uh, house homeless veterans. And uh, you can see there uh, Mayor Rothschild on the uh, left out of Tucson and Mayor Roberts out of Charlotte on the right. Uh, we began this work about a year and a half ago in a partnership with Wells Fargo and um, have really over the course of now having done a half a dozen of these events really begun to learn some lessons uh, that I think can be helpful to you all in your work. Next slide. You can see there the cities that we've done these events in so far. Uh, you can see more information and we've uh, tried to compile some of those lessons in that, um, in that best practice uh, publication that you see there on the on the left uh, that you can access at nlc.org slash mayor's challenge. Uh, beyond Charleston, Madison, Tucson, Charlotte, Omaha, and Orlando, uh, we'll be doing an event in St. Louis um, in the next couple of weeks. And one of the, the things that we have really learned, if you go ahead over to the next slide, is really the value of part of engaging with the local apartment associations. Uh, we initially in um, Charleston and uh, in Tucson did not work with the apartment association. It was only once we got uh, into Madison and Omaha uh, that it really became apparent to us that we needed another voice uh, to really try and broaden the net of landlords that we were really working with. And so we started to reach out to the apartment associations and let them know that their local elected official um, was a part of the mayor's challenge, um, was committed to ending veteran homelessness, that there were a lot of stakeholders in the community that were uh, actively and regularly working to improve their coordination and the collaboration happening uh, to house homeless veterans, but they needed access to units and so that we needed these landlords to step up. And um, when, for, for some reason, when they heard it from the landlord association or from the local apartment association, um, we really got more folks to begin showing up to our events. Um, the national umbrella organization is the National Apartment Association, and so we've really begun to partner more with their local affiliates. Uh, and you can find that, of course, on the National Apartment Association website. And if you just Google your, your city apartment association, uh, typically something pops right up. Um, I think one of the things in thinking through some of this uh, that we have learned in talking um, to, to landlords is really that third uh, bullet point that when we have been talking with landlords, we have really recognized that it is uh, very much, much a business for these folks. So we want to really make it easy for them to get the questions that they might have answered. And we have found that those questions generally fall into three buckets that you see there. The, the questions related to overall inspections, uh, the questions related to overall case management with clients, and questions related to the contracts in terms of receiving payment. And um, in terms of eviction prevention, you know, we have learned that it is really important for landlords um, on that case management side to really understand the the wealth of resources that case managers are able to provide uh, to clients and really get the landlords to understand that case managers are a real asset uh, when there are housing subsidies involved and when there is a uh, case management involved because those case managers can ensure uh, that there is ready connection to not only, of course, the housing supports, but also any employment supports and other supports like you're seeing there, the food assistance like WIC and SNAP, uh, access to the low-income home energy assistance program, um, and child care supports. And so I think one of the, the, the lessons is 
that as you all are beginning to work more with landlords to educate them, it might be helpful to consider talking with landlords about how you can help them maintain the tenancies uh, of their uh, of their renters uh, with access to these resources in the community. Uh, and hopefully that will help them come to trust you all and open up a new dialogue with you all about how you can better partner with them in the community. I think the last thing that has really been occurring to me as I've been listening to Daniel and John uh, so far today um, has been really, again, the role that I hope you all will continue to view the Mayor's Challenge as a mechanism for engaging your local elected officials. Uh, we've really heard about the importance of uh, city leadership and the, the, the local politics that are at play um, when considering ordinances like a local version of the Protecting Tenants and Foreclosure Act or rent stabilization ordinances or just cause ordinances or uh, like uh, John just went over the right to counsel ordinances. And as we are making progress on veteran homelessness, uh, there is the opportunity with the engagement of local elected officials in the mayor's challenge to go back to these officials and, and talk with them about additional ways that they can support efforts to end veteran and all forms of homelessness. And as was really talked about, city officials are particularly interested, of course, in opportunities to further address this that don't cost the city money and, in fact, can actually save the city money. And so I hope you, that is something that you all will take away uh, to, to use, again, the Mayor's Challenge as that mechanism and platform for initiating those conversations. And, of course, we here at NLC are ready to be partners with you all to help initiate and facilitate some of those conversations uh, should you feel that it's helpful to have a third party like NLC involved in some of those conversations. And that's very much the role that we see ourselves playing on a lot of these issues is really that liaison between a lot of the community stakeholders that are working on this and our members who are the local officials and really be, being able to provide that, that neutral third party um, uh, engagement uh, platform uh, for the exchange of information and ideas. And we are able to pull from our experience in working on this issue with communities across the country. Um, for example, uh, we are having a Mayor's Challenge uh, luncheon as part of our conference here uh, in just under two weeks here in D.C. where we'll be bringing together about two dozen uh, mayors that are a part of the challenge uh, to learn about how uh, certain cities are dealing with encampments. Um, and now that the federal government, particularly this year, is placing a priority on um, ending unsheltered veteran homelessness. And so we'll be featuring the Mayor of Charleston uh, about how he has handled an encampment issue uh, there. So uh, next slide has my contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or if there's any way that I can be of help. Um, of course, I encourage you to visit our resources at nlc.org slash marriage challenge. Um, and you can see uh, my Twitter handle there on the left. And uh, we have a marriage challenge Twitter handle there on the right, which I hope you all will follow. And we also have a Mayor's Challenge Facebook page, which I hope you'll uh, join on, on Facebook as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elijah. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Janelle for a couple of feedback polls, and then we will have time for a, just a few questions at the end. Janelle? Thanks, Tristia. So, uh, folks, if you can just take a look at the poll that has appeared on your screen, you can answer by clicking just right in that window. We would like to know if this webinar increased your knowledge of renters' rights issues and protections. Um, and your options are yes, a lot, yes, a little, or no, not really. So we would just like to know if you found this um, helpful today. So it looks like about half of folks have voted. I'll leave it open for just a little bit longer. Please go ahead and um, just click right on your screen. Okay, I'll leave it open for about five more seconds. Okay.
So this is great. About 55% of you said this was uh, very helpful, 42% a uh, little helpful, and 4% not so helpful. Um, so let's take just one more poll before we move on to our Q&A portion. And last question that we'll ask you to answer today, will you use what you learned today in your work or advocacy? Will you be able to take this back and apply it to what you do? Um, your options are yes, no, or not applicable. So if you could just um, select one of those options there on your screen. About half of participants have voted so far, so I'll leave it up for just a little while longer. Okay, I'll leave it for about five more seconds. All right. And about 85% of you said, yes, you will be able to take this back um, and use what you learned today in your work or advocacy, which is fantastic. We're very, um, very happy to hear that. So thank you, everyone, for participating in those polls. Um, and so now we're going to move into just, uh, we have time for just a few quick uh, questions and answers. Um, Tristia, would you like to take it away? Yes, thank you. Uh, one question referred to what I mentioned earlier in my portion uh, about the legislation introduced by Representative Keith Ellison from uh, Minnesota and the bill that I was referring to that is now pending in Congress that would make the Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act permanent law is H.R. 915, that's HR 915, and it's entitled Permanently Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act of 2017. Uh, and that would uh, reinstate the act to make it permanent federal law. And uh, we highly encourage everyone who's listening and interested in that issue to uh, call your representative and uh, voice your support for that legislation. We also, and I'm very encouraged to see so many people asking about how to join the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign. We welcome everyone uh, to visit the website at www.housingnothandcuffs. Dot org. There you can endorse the campaign, you can learn more about what the campaign uh, is doing, uh, what our neighboring communities are doing, and also you can uh, <clears throat> find some of the tools. Uh, we don't have as many up there as will soon be uh, placed into um, uh, online, uh, but you'll, uh, you'll see a number of tools there, model legislation, and please be on the lookout for a litigation manual that the Law Center will be releasing later this month that is also uh, a critical campaign tool. There's a place for everyone, if you're an organizer, if you're a policy advocate, if you're a litigator, if you are someone who's a communications expert, if you're a funder, if you are a government official, we are looking for endorsements and participation in the campaign from everyone. Uh, and there is a listserv where we can all communicate so that uh, you can find out what's happening nationally to help you with your local advocacy work. And for more information about the campaign, if you don't find it on the website, please do feel free to reach out to uh, myself at the Law Center. And I have, let me see, there is, uh, looks like we were just at time. Uh, so there were a couple of other questions that were sent in. I uh, apologize that we're not able to get to them now, but please, um, if you are interested in having us respond personally to those questions, please do send them. Use the contact information that we've provided to you and send those questions directly to the uh, presenter that you think would most appropriately be able to answer them or to the Law Center and we can track down an answer for you. Thank you again so much for joining us today for uh, a webinar in our Housing Not Handcuffed series, this one on renters' rights protections. Uh, I'm glad to see so many of you plan to use this in your work. Please go forth and do, and let us know your uh, stories. We love to hear about how these things are operating on the ground, so do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you all, and have a great afternoon.